Good afternoon. Don't make me use this. Good afternoon, everyone. If we could have your attention, please. Please don't make me use this. Uh, I'm Dave Summers, Snohomish County Executive and President of the Puget Sound Regional Council. I just want to welcome you all here today. What a great crowd and turnout, so thank you all for your time. And what a great venue, although I have to admit I'm a little nervous. Uh, just a great venue, and Josh, thank you and your team for uh, finding the space for us. So welcome to the 2018 General Assembly. I'd like to take just... Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'd like uh, to take just a moment to introduce the head table. Uh, we have Pierce County Executive Bruce Dammeyer, PSRC Vice President and Chair of the Operations. Bruce, good to see you. Tacoma Council Member Ryan Mello. Ryan, oh, okay. Ryan's chair of the Growth Management Policy Board, and we have Redmond Council Member uh, Hank Morgan, Mar Margison, I'm sorry. It was handwritten, and I'm <laughs> vice chair. Sorry, Hank. Uh, Seattle Council Member Rob Johnson, chair of the Transportation Policy Board. Rob? Paulsboro Mayor Becky Erickson, Vice Chair of the Transportation Policy Board. <laughs> Snohomish County Council Member Terry Ryan, President of the Economic Development District Board. Uh, Pierce County Council Member Connie Ladenberg, uh, Vice President of the EDD Board. <laughs> and we have Josh Brown, our PSRC Executive Director. And we also have our immediate past president, Mayor John Marcioni of Redmond. So that's it. We're going to uh, move in to the, um, oh, and I did, wanted to mention that we do have a quorum, so we're good there. We'll move into public comments. Do we have anyone signed up? Yes, we do. I've got a sign-up sheet. Each member of the public wishing to give comment has two minutes to speak. We have an on-screen timer, so the speakers will be able to see um, when their time is up and ask you to respect that. We discourage people from using obscenities and personal attacks, so please be mindful that you're giving uh, public comment today. So our first speaker is Alex Zimmerman. And how are we, uh, do we have, uh, yeah, we've got a microphone there. Hi, my dirty double A Fuhrer, a Nazi social democratic mafia with progressive Gestapo principle. My name is Alex Zimmerman, I am president of Stand Up America. Guys, you all criminal. Rules what is you establish here, now, and he repeats this, is a pure constitutional crime. You all criminal, and I talk about this for one year, what is you established school. But most dangerous criminal is Seattle in King Country. This bandita. A racketeering, a killer, what is we need stopping? We need stopping in country in Seattle government totally. All council, mayor, executive is all criminal for another few years. This criminal, with your support, establish a collusion between Sound Transit, City Seattle, Amazon, Microsoft, and Boeing, who cost us $200 billion. If we all will pay for this. I ask you, everybody who have American blood, you understand how I'm talking? We need to stop in this cretina, this criminal, this bandita. And I'm talking about this every day, 1,600 times. Not too many people listen to me. So my question right now, very simple. When Washingtonian will be stand up, he cleans this dirty garbage rats who drink from fat cat toilet. Pardon, from fat cat toilet. Exactly what is I want to explain to you. So when you don't stop and be more American, we not support people like my president right now. You understand what this means? We fallen and fallen and fallen. I 30 years live here, more than 30 years, and I see every day is worse and worse and worse. America disappear because you freaking a natural born degenerate idiot. Is this exactly who I have right now to power? So I repeat right now to every who listen to me, to all Washingtonians, stand up, 
We need to clean this dirty fascism with Nazi Gestapo principle. What is I see in King Country in Seattle? All of it. Stand up, America. Thank you. Paul Locke. Paul. Uh, okay, we're getting the microphone to Mr. Locke. I'm Paul W. Lock. I am against public employees having to pay union dues to work for us. It shouldn't happen. It shouldn't happen. They shouldn't have to pay union dues to work for the public. I think you should be taking action to stop it. Public employees' unions should not be permitted. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Locke. Will Knedley. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Will Knedlick. American democracy is established 12 score and two years ago cannot thrive when elected officials rely on constant lies, and it may well not survive endless mendacities. Outside the precincts of the White House and the Environmental Protection Agency currently, it would be difficult to find a less intellectually honest document than, than the one that this regional planning organization has brought to the General Assembly today for the purpose of encouraging you to violate your oath of office to approve it this afternoon. As testimony presented to the Executive Committee on April 26th indicated in the form provided to you, the Regional Transportation Plan update now before this body for its consideration relies on PSRC's utter defiance for Article 2, Section 40 of the Constitution, this agency's explicit statutory lease cost planning methodology duties pursuant to RCW 4780030 and your obligations to look at, quote, the costs of and effects on public services such as utilities, roads, fire, and police protection that may result from the proposal pursuant to, to WAC 17411. This hat trick of willful unlawfulness against our state's constitutions, its statutory law, and its environmental rules when taken together create adverse consequences ensuring that no other governmental agency could or does bear as much responsibility as this organization for inadequate maintenance causing the crumbling of our state road system, which is essential for multimodal transportation, able to move people and freight efficiently, and which thus uh, is general, genuinely central for sustaining economic development. I urge you not to use your vote today to violate your, your oath of office and approve a plan that clearly is unconstitutional, statutorily violative, and uh, in violation of state environmental regulations. Thank you. Thank you. David Goebel. Uh, please excuse me if I'm a little nervous. My name is David Goebel, and 20 years ago I bought eight acres and a cabin on rural Vashon Island, uh, specifically because it was such a beautiful, peaceful, uh, quiet and peaceful place and very natural. Uh, and I'd never heard of the Puget Sound Regional Council until I started trying to research what turned my life upside down about three years ago. And it was the FAA's Next Gen program. Or it's branded in Seattle area as greener skies over Seattle, but in reality it's been anything but. And the PSSRC, led by principal planner uh, Stephen Keel, has been a major cheerleader and apologist for the next gen or greener skies over Seattle. Next gen is something of a catch-all word that the FAA uses for a variety of technologies. But in Seattle, so far anyway, it has to do with the use of what are called RMPs, Required Navigational Procedure Flight Paths, for downwind arrivals on the west side of the airport. It creates a razor-sharp focused path that every single arriving flight takes. In the past, the, the arrival of flights on the west side over Vashon and generally the west side would be spread over a wide swath several miles wide. 
with NextGen and these RMPs, it focuses them into a single razor sharp line using GPS technology that limits it to about plus or minus 100 feet, so literally the exact same path. Uh, and so every single plane, about up to 20 per hour, come over my cabin, uh, and every single one's following the exact same path. And as part of an attempt to do what's called optimized descent profile, they went and lowered the altitude several thousand feet as well. Uh, so it just turned what used to be a peaceful, beautiful rural place into just uh, all I hear are planes instead of the birds and, and the wind rustling through the trees. Well, I'm not going to get through all this, clearly. Uh, <laughs> so as, as it, the intention was that it was going to reduce pollution, but because it went and extended what are called level offs, which cause excess fuel burn, the, the, the FAA's own numbers show that it has increased level offs by 40%. Uh, and that's just, a, that's overall for the airport. They're only on the west side, so that's my time. But if anyone's interested in talking to me, I'll be here. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goldman. Vic Bishop. Thank you. My name is Vic Bishop, and I live at 2114 West Lake Sammamish Parkway, southeast in Bellevue. Um, I am the uh, chair of the Eastside Transportation Association. However, I'm here speaking on my on, on my myself. I am a professional engineer, a transportation engineer for 50 years in this region. There's a good chance that I've designed a traffic signal or did a traffic study in your community. I've done them in most of them around this region. I have followed PSRC since I was a graduate student in 1964 when PSRC, the predecessor, was doing the first original traffic transportation planning for the region. You are the individuals that give transportation, that, that drive the transportation policy in our community. You have collectively decided that congestion is okay. We can significantly reduce congestion. It is merely a decision. You have decided that 90 minutes from Everett and 90 minutes from Puyallup to Seattle is just okay. That is your collective decision. It's not something you can't do something about. It's something you've decided not to do anything about it. You've decided that allocating more than 75% of our total transportation tax revenue for the region is okay to be spent on transit that carries less than 5% of our daily trips. What in the world are you thinking of? You have decided that our regional highways can deteriorate so that transit can be funded. You have decided that you, you shrug off PSRC's uh, reports Thank you, Mr. that congestion Bishop. has grown by 20% in one year. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. You've made a decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. John Niles. John Niles. Oh, there you are. There. <clears throat> Hello, my name is John Niles. I live in Seattle. I'm the executive director of the Center for Advanced Transportation and Energy Solutions, which is very much focused on road-based mobility. I learned from PSRC that the number of car person trips in cars in the last year was 12.5 million, so it's obviously a big part of our transportation uh, scene. I'm here to tell you about a new book, a new book that's input for the thinking that's going on around here about new mobility. Uh, the city of SeaTac is working on new mobility. They hired Cates to look at electric shuttles, automated shuttles to take people to the senior center and uh, transit stops. This book from Elsevier, it's a it's a textbook, this is the cover, it isn't quite this big, but it is all about the transit of yesterday, the transit of today, and the transit of tomorrow, which is going to have to get much more integrated with small vehicle services one way or the other. 
So PSRC has bought this book. The full title is The End of Driving, Transportation Systems and Public Policy Planning for Autonomous Vehicles. But if it's inconvenient to go to PSRC this summer to read that book, you could buy it yourself. You have to go on the internet and enter only four words to find it. Niles, my last name, and then end of driving. So you enter Niles, end of driving. The book pops up. It's a little expensive, but I have a 30% discount code if you ask me. And I think you'll find it very interesting and pertinent to transportation 2040 and 2050. Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, last speaker is Ernest Thompson. Mr. Thompson. Oh, there you are. Okay. Hello, my name is Ernest Thompson. I live down in Normandy Park near SeaTac, and I'm glad to see a couple of our council members here today. Uh, when we talk about SeaTac, people talk about noise in the south end, but that is the canary in the coal mine. That is the least of our problems. The real problem is pollution that the airport creates. We live in the 100th percentile increased chance of cancer, respiratory disease, dermatological diseases, and this is statistically proven. Putting more people, more airplanes into a sardine can has limits, and that is what we've reached with SeaTac Airport. There is no alternative to building a new airport completely out of King County, and any discussion that goes over transportation needs of the region as a whole that do not include a serious discussion of bullet train technology and above all hyperloop technology is wasting your time. Those are the answers to your pollution problems, those are the answers to your transportation problems and the amount of people you can move. They are more efficient, they are faster. Hyperloop does a minimum of 700 miles an hour. This is not science fiction. They've already signed contracts in Europe and in the Middle East to build the first operational systems within five years. It can be done. The Chinese have built over 25,000 kilometers of bullet trains in 10 years. They plan to build another 25,000 miles or kilometers of bullet trains in the next 10 years. Hyperloop, there are several companies down in Southern California. Elon Musk runs one of them. We know him. Richard Branson runs another one, and there are other people. These are American companies, American technology. They are cost efficient. They are the future. Airplanes are massive polluters, and they are literally a highway jam in the sky that gives us nothing. They are literally a zombie technology compared to bullet trains oh, thank you, and Hyperloop. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that ends the uh, sign-up sheet. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes uh, to give you my president's report. First of all, I want to thank you again for being here today. This is a day when we all come together to talk and think about the region and our roles at uh, Puget Sound Regional Council. It's been a really good year, very active. You're going to hear about uh, some of that and some of our actions. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do in our cities and counties uh, looking to the future. It's important you're here today, and believe me, I know how hard it can get, be to get here. I live outside of Monroe, and I come into Seattle regularly, and it's, it's a struggle. Given the diversity of our communities and our residents, it can sometimes be hard to find common ground. The region has a lot of work to do to prepare for the day when almost two million more people will be living here. The good news is that we are coming together to find solutions that will have a positive impact for generations. Over the next year, we need to update our Vision 2040 plan to get us ready for Vision 2050. The Growth Management Policy Board is starting discussions that will engage us over the next year on that topic. We need to look at where we've been and where we're headed. I'd like to offer three examples of opportunities that are in front of us. Uh, the first is the new 757 or middle of the market aircraft, the NMA. Many here are helping to lead the charge to secure the next new Boeing jet for Washington State. That effort has brought together leaders from across the region and partners across the state. It's a good example of how we can work together to secure a better future and opportunity. The second issue is airports that we've already heard about. 
After all necessary regulatory approvals, three national airlines will be providing new commercial jet service out of Payne Field in Everett. That's my little commercial. <laughs> Thank you. Major construction is underway at SeaTac, and even more is on the way. We need to get ahead of this issue regionally since our ability to grow is in many ways directly tied to our airport's capacity. That's why PSRC is leading a new regional aviation baseline study. That's important to sustaining our competitive edge, keeping cargo moving, and supporting manufacturing jobs all over the region. Of course, we must also understand the impacts of growth on our airport communities. And the third issue is our transportation network. The region's transportation improvement program for the next four years includes over 600 active projects worth a combined total of 70, $37 billion. We have achieved this progress by working together. That puts us ahead of our peers, and believe me, I uh, look around the country and uh, many of us uh, travel, and uh, all, with, uh, even with all the complaining we do and the issues we have, we're, I think, as a region doing uh, an outstanding job. However, the improvements can't come soon enough for everyone here and the millions of people we represent. Later this year, PSRC will add more projects to the transportation pipeline, selecting projects for $525 million in federal funds. As the annual report highlights, we are a region under construction, and we will be more resilient because of it, and our economy will benefit because of it. But we have many big challenges facing us that we need to get right if we're going to sustain our extraordinary quality of life and unparalleled natural environment. These challenges include a rising cost of living, adequate affordable housing, homelessness, and the opioid epidemic. As we plan for growth, we must be realistic and look at the process from a regional perspective. Let me take just one other example. We might make a compelling case for expanding growth in a particular part of the region and assign a certain number for growth. However, if there isn't adequate affordable housing in that area, we will never reach our targets. We must take a hard look at what we're doing as governments to make more affordable housing available. We cannot continue to have extraordinary growth if we don't also have a significant improvement in the stock of affordable housing. We must work as a region to tackle these issues with both our urban and rural communities contributing to the solutions. To help move Snohomish County forward on these issues, I held a Vision 2050 Summit for elected officials in the county. I think uh, this was a good model for spurring collaboration across the region. We provided maps and gave our local elected officials a chance to go through real-time exercises in figuring out how we plan to grow uh, within our county. It was a great way to get everyone thinking about what we need to do for Vision 2050. I encourage others to try this exercise. Be happy to talk to you about it. Uh, the uh, meetings we had, we had amazing um, concurrence of thought within Snohomish County when we looked at the uh, 250,000 people that are headed our way in the next 20 years, and we looked at our infrastructure and our county. Uh, I think we were headed towards a common vision as a county. So there's a lot of work ahead. Let's get started. I am a sincere believer in regionalism and working together and sorting through our, our problems together. PSRC is our forum for doing that, and I'm proud to be a part of that. So thank you. So we're going to move on to the consent agenda. I'll take a motion on the minutes from last year. Any comments? All those in favor say aye. Any opposed? All right. Consent agenda is adopted. New business. The adoption of the FY 2018-2019 Supplemental Biennial Budget and Work prog Program, and I would like to call on Executive uh, Bruce Dammeyer to present uh, the Supplemental Budget and Work Program to you. Bruce? Thank you very much, Dave. It's, I'm pleased to present to you our 2018-19 Supplemental Budget and Work Plan. For those of you who are new to this, this is a responsibility that is preserved for the General Assembly 
So while there has been a lot of process to this budget, the operations committee, which I chair, has done a lot of work on it. We're kind of responsible for developing it. It has been worked in coordination with the growth management uh, planning board, the transportation planning board, and the economic development district. It has been approved by both the operations committee and the uh, executive board, but ultimately the power lies here. So that's why we're gonna take a couple minutes and make sure you understand what went into it and what brings us here today. If we go to the next slide, please. So before you is the operations committee. If you're not familiar with the operations committee, this are the folks listed on the screen. And if you're a member of the operations committee, would you please stand? And I know who you are, so Nancy, stand up. Terry, stand up, come on. So for, yeah, more of them didn't stand up, but we'll talk about that at our next meeting. Um, so you need to know that this group of folks meets before the executive board. So they sign up for another meeting and we go through in depth into the, not only the budget, but various contracts, various expenditures, planning documents like that. We do the, the detail work that you want done, but we can't all do it, to, you know, so we delegate it to the operations board. So I'm really proud of the work. I can tell you they ask, very hard and meticulous questions, and it's sometimes it's tough to get them done on time, but they do very, very good work, and I think this budget is part of that. I also wanted to take a second to make sure that we acknowledge the re, where I said the, the committee develops the budget. We all know that's not entirely true, that the staff, the finance team develops the budget, uh, headed by uh, Diana Lauterbach down here. Let's hear for Diana. You may not know that we recently got a national award for budgeting. How's that for the ultimate in planning nerdism? That's fantastic. And kind of more importantly, uh, while we have been, you know, we, we all go through state audits, right? We have not, we've had one finding in 18 years of state audits for the Puget Sound Regional Council. That's right, Nancy, let's clap for that. So with that, if we could have the next slide. Okay, so this is the second year of a biennial budget. Our budget is $27.5 million. And I would describe this as, as steady state, steady as you go, stable, kind of only a minor, in my world, I would say there's almost only a minor technical tweak from the previous year. So that's a good, speaks well to the, to the biennial budget that we passed last year. It's executing well, and it's holding up well before you. So there's only very, very minor changes. As you can see, and those of you who are crafty veterans from this meeting, these are the same charts we show every time. It won't surprise you that fifth, the vast majority of our money comes from federal grants, right, 57%. That is the biggest chunk of it, 4% from state grants, 16% uh, is provided to match federal and state grants. And it won't surprise you that the vast majority of the council's expenditures are in salaries and benefits. So I'm sure there's nothing in there that is kind of surprising. And as again, this is a sec this is the second year, so the supplemental year of a biennial budget that is, I think the last time I looked, the adjustment was like a $40,000 adjustment on a $27.5 million budget. So that's, that is pretty darn good. So with that, I'm gonna go on to the next slide and this is the action for the day. So I am, uh, I am recommending, and the executive board recommends, that we adopt the supplemental fiscal years 2018-19 biennial budget and work plan as recommended by the executive board, and that we adopt resolution uh, PS, PSRCA 2018-01 authorizing submittal of the adopted budget fiscal years 2018-19 supplemental budget and work plan to the appropriate federal and state agencies so we continue to get the federal and state dollars. So we're adopting the budget and we're authorizing that budget to be submitted to the feds and to the state to get more money. Does everybody, everybody make sense? So what I would like to entertain is a motion to do both of those things. Thank you, Commissioner Petridge, seconded by Mayor uh, Woodards from Tacoma. Way to go, Pierce County. Thank you for the support up here. So this is a roll call vote. So right now, Sheila is going to call your name, and you get to vote by jurisdiction. Let me just 
discussion. Yeah. So let me ask before we vote, any debate or discussion on the motion? Seeing none, we'll proceed to the vote. Thank you. King County. Kitsap County. Pierce County. Aye. Snohomish County. Algona. Arlington. Auburn. Bellevue. Black Diamond. Bothell. Bremerton. Buckley. Burien. Darrington. Des Moines. Duval, Edgewood, Edmonds, Everett, Federal Way, Fircrest, Issaquah, Kinmore, Kent, Kirkland, Lake Forest Park, Linwood, Marysville, Medina, Mercer Island, Mill Creek, Montlake Terrace, Muckleteo, Normandy Park, North Bend, Ording. Port Orchard, Polesville, Puyallup, Redmond, Sammamish, SeaTac, Seattle, Shoreline, Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Silicon, Sumner, Tacoma, Tukwila, Port of Seattle, Port of Tacoma, Port of Everett, Washington State Department of Transportation, Washington State Transportation Commission. Are there any jurisdictions that I've missed? How do you vote? Any others? So a uh, vote was unanimous. Thank you very much. Measure passes. Thank you, Bruce. And our uh, next action is the adoption of the Regional Transportation Plan. I'll call on Seattle Council Member Rob Johnson, who is chair of the Transportation Policy Board, to present the Regional Transportation Plan. Thanks, Dave. Um, I'll be brief. We've been talking about this plan for more than two years, and today is my wife's birthday, so I'm in charge of going to pick up the kids from school, so I want to get you out of here on time. Um, we all know why we're here. This action allows federal funding to flow to all of our jurisdictions throughout the region, which is a nice way of saying everybody wants to be friends with Kelly McGurdy and figure out how to unlock this process to get more federal funds to your local jurisdiction. But in all seriousness, this plan represents um, more than two years of really hard work and a set of investments that our chair outlined earlier over the next four years that'll total more than $37 billion. Um, that's a huge round of investments. And I think um, in the past, we've spent a lot of time and energy fighting over the fiscally constrained plan versus what is in the unconstrained plan. We've spent a lot of time talking about center's framework, or we've spent a lot of time talking about climate change and the impacts. We tackled all those issues really early on and worked hard as a region to try to come to a set of uh, really good resolutions which are all reflected in the plan in front of you today. So I want to take a quick minute to just thank those folks who were part of this discussion. If you're a member of the Regional Staff Committee, a member of the Transportation Policy Board, or a member of our Finance Working Group, which should be about three quarters of this body, would you please stand up and be recognized? Thank you for all your great work.
I want to give an extra special uh, moment of recognition to my vice chair, without whom none of this would be possible. Becky Erickson, rarely have I ever worked with somebody who has such a great ability to bridge across multiple jurisdictions with such wonderful aplomb. You chaired our finance working group, and that was a, a tremendous uh, body of work in and of itself. And I'm just so grateful to you for all the work that you've done on behalf of this issue and behalf of the region. So please, Becky Erickson. So without further ado, on behalf of the executive board, I'm pleased to ask for your vote in the affirmative in adoption of our update to our region's transportation plan. Thank you all. All right, is there a motion? Second. All right, is there any discussion? All right, I'll ask Sheila to uh, do our roll call vote. King County, Kitsap County, Pierce County, Snohomish County, Algona, Arlington, Auburn, Bellevue, Black Diamond, Bothell, Bremerton, Buckley, Burien, Covington, Darrington, Des Moines, Duval, Edgewood, I'm sorry, thank you, Edmonds, Everett, Federal Way, uh, Furcrest, Issaquah, Kenmore, Kent, Kirkland, Lake Forest Park, Linwood, Marysville, Medina, Mercer Island, Mill Creek, Montlake Terrace, Mukilteo, Normandy Park, North Bend, Ording, Port Orchard, Polesville, Puyallup, Redmond, Sammamish, SeaTac, Seattle, Shoreline, Snohomish, Snoqualmie, Silicon, Sumner, Tacoma, Tukwila, Port of Tacoma, Port of Seattle, Port of Everett, Washington State Department of Transportation, Washington State Transportation Commission. Are there any jurisdictions that I missed? <laughs> Motion carries 99% uh, of yes. Intended to me look like a 66% anyway. That doesn't make sense. So thank you uh, very much. Uh, our next uh, item of business is election of officers, and I would like to call on Redmond Mayor John Marcioni, our immediate past president, to present the results of this year's nominating committee and its recommendation for PSOC officers. Good afternoon. On April 27th, uh, the PSRC nominating committee had a conference call to discuss the PSRC 2018 officers. I served as chair as past president. Before I give our report, I'd like to let I'd like to tell you who else served on the nominating committee this year. Uh, Council Member Claudia Balducci of King County, Council Member Doug Richardson of Pierce County, Mayor Becky Erickson, City of Paulsbo, Commissioner Charlotte Garrido, 
Kitsap County, Mayor Victoria Woodard, City of Tacoma, Commissioner Dick Barzano, Port of Tacoma, Commissioner Terry Ryan, Sohomish County, and Mayor Cassie Franklin, City of Everett. So I wanna thank the members of the nominating committee for your work this year. I'm pleased to report that the nominating committee recommends our officers to be Snohomish County Executive Dave Summers as president and Pierce County Executive Bruce Danmeyer as vice president. Before I go any further, are there any nominations from the floor? Seeing, seeing none, I close the nominations. I would now entertain a motion uh, to approve the nominating committee's recommendation. Been moved and seconded. Is this a roll call, Sheila? No. This is a voice vote. All in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Opposed? And it passes unanimously. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you for that good work. So it's now my uh, pleasure, and I'm very much looking forward to this, to introduce our mayor's panel. I'd like to note first that there are over 130 newly elected local leaders this past year from across the region, and just over one third of them are women. It, and it tells me in my notes, pictures of all 20 women mayors will appear on the screen. So is that, there, we, there we go. So let's be, As of today, 54% of the people who live in our cities and towns have a woman as their mayor. We'd like for everyone here to get the opportunity to know some of the region's newest leaders a little better. So we've asked our friend, Paulsville Mayor Becky Erickson, uh, to lead a conversation with three new mayors from the largest cities in King, Pierce, and Snohomish counties. Seattle's Jenny Durkin, Tacoma's Victoria Woodards, and Everett's Cassie Franklin. Mayor Erickson has been a model for strong leadership herself. She pays attention to the details, does her homework, shows up, speaks up, is respectful of different opinions, and is just all around a great person to work with. And I mean that sincerely. I think we all uh, feel that way. We're very grateful for her commitment not just to Paul's bow, but to the rest of the region. And with that, I'd like to uh, let Becky take charge. There you are. Speaks up. That's commonly called mouthy, okay? I'm known as being mouthy, okay? I speak my mind when I need to speak my mind. I think that uh, the first thing I would like to say is when the PSRC staff asked me to moderate this panel, <clears throat> I was uncomfortable. I said, why do we want to talk about women mayors? And the reason why, why I reacted that way is because, golly gee, I just want people to think of me as a mayor, not a woman mayor. And... <clears throat> Um, and I thought about it for a while, and I thought, but this is a huge honor because um, it is, it's, it's kind of a milestone where women in political leadership are, are coming of age. And uh, it's been a long time coming. I've watched The Post le lately a lot. Have you guys seen the movie The Post with Meryl Streep? Who's seen the movie? Okay. That's the way I was raised. Okay? I was raised that... You know, I did the dishes. I had to learn how to do the dishes. And um, when I wanted to go on to grad school, my dad said, why would you want to do that? You're just going to get married and have babies. Okay, so that's where I come from. And I think a lot of women come from that same place. So to find myself and to find us all standing up here doing what we're doing, sometimes it's kind of like, who me? You know, how did I get here, right? It's, it's pretty tough. So with that, I'd like to call up two wonderful mayors, and I guess Mayor Durkin is on her way. I'd like to call up Mayor Woodard from Tacoma. Victoria, is it Victoria? Vicki? 
Victoria, okay. She's a woman, okay. And Mayor Cassie Franklin, Cassie from Everett. And folks, when Mayor Durkin arrives, uh, we'll have her come up here and we will have her enter the conversation. Now, the next thing I'm gonna do, ladies, is I'm gonna try to ch channel Oprah here, which is really gonna be scary. Okay, so let's see if we can pull this off. I'm gonna move over to the table. The first question. Ooh, tall mic. The first question I have is, just frankly, how's it going? I mean, seriously, when I first became a mayor, it was like drinking from a fire hose. Okay, so I'm just going to be very, very upfront. How's it going? It is like drinking from a fire hose. Um, and I thought as a former city council member, I had, already, I had already drinking from that fire hose, and I thought maybe the pressure wouldn't be as high when I became mayor, but the pressure, oh, there she is. Yay. Woo! Yay! <laughs> Um, but the pressure was even higher than it was when I was a council member. But I will tell you, as I was writing up today with my executive, Pierce County Executive Bruce Danmeyer, we were having that same conversation. I said, you know, for me, I think it is the job where my head and my heart finally got connected. And I feel like I have the best job in the entire world. I tell people I get to wake up every single day and think about everything that I do that makes my city a better place for everyone who lives there. And I think that's the greatest role that we get to play is every decision we make affects somebody in our community. And that's how we have to think about all the things that we're doing. So I love it. I'm having a great time. If you do this next year, I might feel a little bit differently, but the honeymoon right now is going really well. How about you? How are you doing? I I, I can't agree more. First, I, I, as you were making your comments uh, up there, I feel very much like I'm up here. Yeah. It, this is me, and um, I didn't. People ask me all the time, "Did you have grand goals of being mayor?" And I didn't. Growing up, I did not think I was going to be mayor. But I agree wholeheartedly with Victoria. This is the best job on the planet. I absolutely love it. And when people ask me, um, you know, what's the what's the what's the hardest thing, or what's the most surprising thing? I, I have to say, this job is really hard. This is a really hard job, and, and I shouldn't have been surprised about that, but it is a huge job. I was a council member beforehand, as Victoria was, but it's very different to be in the mayor's office, but it is the most rewarding job on the planet because you feel every day uh, that you can make a difference. You get to work side by side with your constituents. You get to work side by side with incredible staff, regional leaders, and, um, and you can see the direct impact of that work. So I love it. Uh, I love the challenge. And I hope I, this honeymoon continues as well. <laughs> Mayor Durkin, how's it going? It's going great. Um, I'm glad I'm in sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know it was just a block from my office. Um, you know, it is really, I would echo here is, it can be hard sometimes. But if you look at what is happening nationally, and you look at where we are kind of in the arc of history right now, I think that progress on the things that matter most to people and that affect their everyday lives, that progress is going to happen locally. It's going to be at the city, the county, and the state level. And I think our region together can set the bar on so many of those challenges that we're facing today by working collaboratively, by moving forward, and yes, it can be really hard because we're in a hard time right now. Um, and we've changed so rapidly as a city and as a region. But at the same time, we have the best assets anywhere to be, do things right. We've got really great companies who are doing cutting edge work. We have really good workers who are innovative, smart, hardworking. We have elected officials at every level of government who are doing it because they want to make a difference. And so for me, I couldn't be more proud or more honored to be the mayor of Seattle, to be a mayor in this region with women like this up here and the people I see out there. Because when we come together, we make a difference and we make a positive difference. So 
it's all the more important when it's hard. You know, when I first decided I was going to run for mayor, people asked me, why are you, are you crazy? No. Yeah. <laughs> that was the first thing, you know, because I came from the council too, right? And I thought, okay, I'm going to run for mayor. And I, people ask me, you know, why, why did you do it? Why are you running? And I, tell, I told people it's because I got mad, okay, because I wanted to do something different. Frankly, why did you all run? Why did you make the decision? Was it one thing? Was it a series of things? When did that light bulb go off in your head that said, yep, you know what, I got to do this? Hard question? No, so I'll start. Uh, you know, I start, decided to run first for, for council when our community started experiencing uh, the devastating impacts of street level social issues, homelessness, addiction. I'd spent my career in the nonprofit sector focused on those issues. And I saw our elected and business leaders truly struggling with these issues and not having the, the tools to, to handle them. And so I, I felt that I had some, some strengths to bring to the table and a skill set that we all have in the nonprofit sector of collaboration, because these are huge issues and huge challenges that we're facing, not just in our local cities, but across the region. And that deep level of collaboration is required for us to be successful. So that's what inspired me to run, uh, first for council, and then for mayor, I, I think I just took a crazy pill. I, you know, I, um, <laughs> it, it really was, it was op obviously an opportunity when our, our longstanding mayor decided not to run for re-election, but again, it was recognizing the enormous uh, challenges that we were facing and the huge opportunity and potential of our city and our region. I felt like that skill set of collaboration and regionalism and working across jurisdictions and across different systems was going to be necessary for our success. So I wanted to be a part of it. Who's next? Why did you do it? So I have been in and around public service pretty much my whole life. As many of the people in the room know, my father was a state legislator for the whole time I was growing up. My mom doorbelled when she was pregnant with me. Um, if we could walk, we could doorbell. Um, <laughs> But I always, I always avoided running for office. I served in other ways, and the last service I had before running for mayor was I was President Obama's United States Attorney here in the Western District. And I loved that job. I, it was just really such an honor to serve in Western Washington, but serve for an agency whose name was a public value, justice, and work with people throughout Western Washington. But when I left, I pretty much thought I was done with public service. Um, and then, I don't know if anyone in this room has noticed, but my politics and values are not necessarily aligned with our presidents. And <laughs> when he was elected, for me, the world started spinning just a little bit differently. Um, and mostly because it was my oldest son's first election he voted in. And more and more, I see the world through my children. And I think about what is the world we are leaving for our children? Because my parents worked really hard and left me a better world than they had. Um, and I was reminded about this weekend when I went and visited my parents who were both buried at Tahoma National Cemetery about the sacrifice of that generation. And so in talking to people and looking at how is it we can have a better world and ensure a better world, I truly don't believe much good is going to come out of Washington, D.C. for a variety of reasons for at least four more years. It's so gridlocked and so partisan locked. If we're gonna make progress again, I believe it's at the local level. It's when we can put down our differences, we can work collaboratively, we can do it city to city, in the region, across party lines, and think about what do we wanna leave our children here in Seattle throughout this region? And so for me, the motivation was if I wanted to tell other people to step up, I had to be willing to do it myself. Mayor, Mayor Woodards, go ahead. Well, honestly, I never wanted to to be in elected office. <laughs> Actually, before I became an elected official, I worked for an elected official, Harold Moss on the county council. And I thought there is no way in the world I ever want to do a job like that. Um, and then I started my political career on the parks board um, and found that I loved what the parks board did, but more than that, I loved policy. And on top of that, um, in, most, in most cases, um, when I walked into a room as an elected official, I was the only woman. And if I wasn't the only woman, I definitely was the only person of color. And so I started to feel like 
because I could be in those rooms, I had an obligation to be in those rooms, to stand up for the people whose voices would not be heard. And so I went from the park board to the city council um, and, and got to make a real difference on the city council. But again, I really felt like it was my job to be there for the voices who couldn't be heard. And frankly, why I decided to run for mayor is because lots of people, I couldn't go to a grocery store or a church or the mall or take out my own trash without somebody saying, when are you gonna run for mayor? I want you to be my mayor. And I'm thinking, I got seven years on the city council. I'm pretty good. I, I, that's, that's good enough for me. And I kept hearing everybody wanting me to be, that, be their mayor. And I think as mayors and just as elected officials as all of you, we don't represent ourselves. We represent the people that we serve. And if everybody wanted me to be their mayor, and not everybody, obviously, because there was 40% of them who didn't vote for me, but if the majority of people wanted me to run, then I should run and I should lead. Um, and while I was thinking about it, as Mayor Durkin said, November 8th happened, November 9th, 2016. That was enough for me to say, I will not be able to control what happens on the national level, but I have an opportunity to step up and be a leader in my city. And I can help control what happens here. And for that reason, I will run. And I did. Um, I don't know. I've been doing, I've been a mayor now. This is my ninth year. Okay, I'm beginning my third term. And I think I average about 60 to 65 hours a week. Have you guys thought about how many hours you're working and what that's doing to your family and how do you balance all that? Go ahead. Look, it's the greatest toll. Even if you think you have a pretty good estimation of the toll it will take on you and your family, then you gotta times it by about 10. Um, there is just, at least in the city of Seattle, um, being mayor at this particular time, I probably am more successful in counting the hours I don't work yeah. because <laughs> there are a lot fewer. Um, there's no weekends, there's no evenings, um, and because it's such a close and proximate job, I'm sure you feel this, and I can look out in the room and I see other people in this thing, people know you. I mean, I will be out for dinner, and people will that I've never seen before will sit down at my table and start telling me about the problem they see and the <laughs> solutions. If they have the solutions, I'm happy. That's right. <laughs> and they'll just sit down and talking, and what happened this weekend, it, was a, it has been a... Um, it's been a very active time in the city of Seattle the last few weeks. Uh, and I had someone, I was out to dinner with my partner. We had literally not been out to dinner for a very long time. We sat down, we're eating. This person sits down at the table and starts, uh, I won't say yelling, but being passionate about a particular city issue. And finally, my partner said, can we please have dinner? Um, so it is, but it's also one of the things that makes it real. As hard as that part of it is, being able to, for people to be able to do that is so important right now. Because I think people feel paralyzed and helpless because they're not sure that they're being heard anywhere. And so I think we feel it most as local officials. I see so many people in the audience nodding in these eyes, you know, doing this. Yeah. Um, and it is part of the hardest part. Um, I see some of my fellow city council members, you know, who have taken a lot of passion recently. It's hard. But at the same time, it's just a reflection of where we are as a city and a society. And when we step as leaders, we have to be kind of like, if anyone here is old enough as me to remember Star Trek, the empath, you know, the person who would touch the person was hurting and then they would become sick themselves, but they become well. That's kind of our job as local officials. Go ahead. Who's next? Well, after, after probably my first month on the job, um, I called who I call my mayor. Mayor Strickland will always be my mayor. Everybody's like, well, you're the mayor. I go, yes, I'm your mayor, but I need my own mayor. Mm -hmm. So Mayor Strickland is my mayor. And I called her and I said, oh my God, how did you, <laughs> how, how do I get control of my calendar? And she said, um, talk to me in year two. Yep. So I, I have accepted that year one is going to be the way that it is. And so I no longer worry about it. Luckily for me, um, I just have a dog at home who people probably might want to say I'm neglecting my dog or call the authorities on me. Um, but you know, as, as, I, uh, as Mayor Durkin said, it's, I, for me, it's the best part of the job. Um, the busyness in meeting with people and hearing their ideas and their thoughts, and you're right, you can't go anywhere. Um, as a council member, nobody knew who I was. 
Um, as mayor, it is different. I was in the dentist office for my own appointment, um, and I'm sitting there getting ready to get x-rays, and the lady comes in and goes, oh, I understand I have the pleasure of working on the mayor today. And I'm thinking to myself, I have not brushed my teeth before I came to the dentist. <laughs> I'm thinking I'm incognito. Now I'm going to hear the mayor didn't brush her teeth before she goes to the dentist. But and you said, give me more gas. Exactly, <laughs> something. Um, but, but not only did she say she gets to work on the mayor, she proceeded to tell me about her issues on the south end. Um, with a drill in her hand. I mean, with, yeah, and I'm like, you fixed whatever it, didn't your you? problem is, I will fix it. What, but, but, you know, it's just... Um, there's there's that piece of it, but then there's also, um, for me, again, as a woman of color, the piece of it that warms my heart, right? Going to all of these things. And when you have a little African-American girl who walks up to you and she says, you're the mayor? And I say, I'm the mayor. And she goes, really, you're the mayor? And I said, yeah. She goes, I can be a mayor. I said, absolutely, you can be a mayor. So if that's the effect of this, is that, if that is the effect that this busyness has, um, the busyness in my life has on my community. If it if it's that way in year two, year three, year four, and in the next four years, um, I'll just I've decided that my work life balance is going to be different. It it does get easier. It, okay? it does it first, does get easier. Yeah, it does. First, I figured I'm going to stop at some. Point. The first year and a half are are really okay. hard. Okay, but then there's a learning curve here, and you know I've had been a business manager and executive for many years, but I had no idea about. The, the pace of being a mayor, but you guys are still in the learning, you know, the ramping up, and you know, and it is you're you're drinking from a fire hose, but it does actually get a little easier. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I I think it it is 24/7 job. It is absolutely a 24/7 job. I've got my cell phone next to my bed so that our police chief or fire chief can call me in the middle of the night if there's an emergency, so that I'm aware of it before I get to the office in the morning. Um, fortunately, my, my family is extroverted, so my, my nine-year-old daughter is as much of an extrovert as me, so when we go to the grocery store and we're stopped for folks that want to talk about their park or their potholes or whatever policy they like or don't like, she's like, hi, this is the mayor. She's my mom. And, <laughs> and then it usually wins people over, so it, it's, it's great for, for angry constituents to have my little girl with me, but no, it is, it is a 24-7. It wasn't too much of an adjustment. I mean, obviously, you all know as elected leaders, the campaign is the best preparation for that 24-7 that you can have. And it's no different for us as women mayors than it is for anyone else out there in elected leadership. So what I guess I've been trying to do as a, as a, as a younger mayor that has a young child um, at home is kind of change narrative that life is part of me being mayor. Uh, my deputy mayor, Nick, also has young kids. And you'll see our kids on the 10th floor of City Hall. And sometimes we got to pick them up sick from school, and I still have to go back to the office and, and be mayor and, and do this job. And I feel like that is good modeling for the rest of the team that this is possible, and I am a mayor, and I'm a mom, and all of that has to happen at the same time. So yeah, I want to follow. I think that's really true. I haven't. I've always in the workplace first because when my kids were young, I needed it, and then when I was U.S. Attorney. Now I have a corner that's just kids' table, kids' toys. And I tell everyone who works in my office that they got to bring the kids in, great. I mean, I'm sorry they have to. I'd rather they be able to stay home or do whatever they need to do. But if they do, great, and leave them here. I mean, I'll entertain them. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think there's also a thing we can do together. And I look at each of these tables. I, all of us can do this together is I think the thing that each one of us can model better is civility. And we are living in a really very emotional, passionate, difficult time. And we see it show up in public discourse in ways that I think are really hard. And whatever our political differences are as elected leaders and officials and business people, I think if we model civility and can get past disagreement to disagreeable, you know, I'll give you an example is um, there, was a, there was a group that is, they don't love me, I don't understand it. <laughs> um, and they had a campaign right before May Day where they put a bunch of posters around the city with my head on a pike with blood coming out. And I found out because my teenager was taking a date to an area where they saw it, right? Not the thing you want to see your kids to see. But that kind of discourse shows up to people that I may not always agree with, but who are treated in the civic manner in a way that just isn't right. 
And so I would just urge everyone in this room, that all of us, no matter how tired we get, no matter how strongly we feel about something, no matter how much we might kind of part of me think, ha, 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 look at them, we see to ourselves, look, if we really want to have a region where people can solve problems, we have to model civility and demand civility from people. Because then I think if we focus on the things we agree on, or at least the problems we know we all want to solve, we'll get to that point better. I, yeah, which, which is a, a good segue into, you know, which is a good segue <laughs> into, which is a, Which is a good segue into the kind of the, one of the region, reasons why we're here, which is Puget Sound Regional Council tells us that we're going to have to take in two more, two more, uh, two million more people into our region by the year 2050. What are we going to do? What are your priorities? What do you? What's your visioning like? I, you know, what do? You, wh how's your crystal ball? What, what do you see going forward? for two million additional people in our community? Well, I think, you know, for us, um, you know, Tacoma's like many cities, we were hit severely by the 2008 recession. Um, and new construction for us just halted. Um, and I think Tacoma is fortunate to be in a place where things are starting to move again. Um, and we, while we, we were stopped, we weren't on track for meeting our, our, you know, the vision goals. I think we're back on track. Um, we're working to accommodate, you know, out of that 2 million, another 127,000 people and 97,000 jobs by 2040. Um, our council just had our council retreat in February, and we put four issues on the table that we really want to focus on. Much not that, and this list won't be unlike any um, of the other cities, but um, public safety, because obviously that's our number one duty, but um, affordable housing, economic development, and all of us are facing the crisis of homelessness. Success in these areas for us, we know that it requires a regional focus, that we're not going to be able to um, attack these issues just by being the city of Tacoma. Again, great conversation with my executive today. All of these issues that we're facing, not only are they regional as we look at Pierce, King, Snohomish, and Kitsap County, but they're regional just within our county. Um, and I think all of us could do a better job at really focusing and working together regionally and not just coming together for the sake of coming together, but actually moving some issues. And, and you're right, Jenny, again, you said, you know, sometimes we're going to disagree. Counties and cities do. But we can, we can continue to work on the things we disagree on separately, but the things that we agree on, we know we've got to move forward together. One of the biggest struggles for all of us is housing. How are we going to address housing? Well, second to paying, paying for your housing costs, the largest bill in a household is transportation. And transportation is something that we're already all working together, but we've got to continue to move the needle with sound transit, um, with the work that they're doing, and then just with our own public transportation. Um, I think if we do that, we can continue to align jobs, transit opportunities, and housing. Um, but until we continue to address, until we address these issues together, or we've already done some of it, but until we continue to address these issues together, I don't think we're going to make as much headway as we need to. How about you, Mary Franklin? Yeah, so in Everett, we also are, are very excited to finally be getting to that place where we can embrace growth. We're excited to see uh, new interest and new opportunities in our city. With that growth comes the diversity we want to see in our city, the, the jobs that we desperately need in our community, and the innovation that supports us all. So. In 20, since 2014, we saw about 1,500 units come into Everett, and now in the pipeline, we have nearly 3,000 units. So we're seeing that boom finally, finally follow into Everett. But we've had, we've struggled like Tacoma in, in meeting the growth expectations. For, for Everett to be successful in that, we would have to take 26% of the growth, but we've only seen 8% of it thus far. So we have our work cut out for us. I think that. Our, our, our challenge is that, you know, there are big greenfield properties that are easily converted into single-family homes in unincorporated parts of our, our community, 
And, um, and then in other urban centers like, like Seattle and Bellevue, you have these really uh, high, high rents so that the developers are really drawn into those areas. So we need some tools. We have some economic barriers to, to embracing that growth. And so we're looking to our regional partners. We're looking to the Puget Sound Regional Council to work in partnership with us because our city is honestly excited to grow. We embrace that growth. We are so ready and, and um, we've been working at a fever pace to kind of draw that in and, and catch up now that, that some of that development is happening in our region. So I think growth is the biggest challenge that we face as a region and how to do it right. Um, I'm looking out at my fellow board members from Sound Transit and Mayor Backus who's on the one table with me. And with growth comes both enormous opportunity, but we also have to have shared responsibility. And so I think as we are looking at, for example, at issues of homelessness, I'm really excited to be working with Mary Bacchus, Mayor Bacchus and Dow Constantine to figure out how do we as a region get more affordable housing as quickly as we can. And when I say affordable housing, I don't mean just deeply affordable housing so that the lowest people among the lowest levels of economic status can have it, but middle class housing. You know, we are kind of the canary in the cage in Seattle. Our middle class housing is vanishing. And people can't afford to be in Seattle and stay in Seattle. So if we don't fix that as well, we lose the civic glue in our cities and our region. So I think that we have to have a shared vision for how we have growth, both where the economic opportunity goes so we can make this a more vibrant region. I really believe that when other parts of this region do better, Seattle does better. And it's part of my job as mayor, not just to look provincially in our borders and how we make sure that we as Seattle do right, but how do we make sure we as a region do right? Um, because if we do that, you know, Ginny Cole Wells has been talking about this for a long time. If we're talking housing affordability, we have to be looking in those areas where people can actually afford the dirt or afford to build or their space. Um, and Seattle, our built environment is one of the most expensive. There's the least space. So we're, our answer is density. It's density around our transit. But we have to be thinking as a region, what does it look not just today and in five years? How do we solve the emergency in front of us? What are we going to be in five years and 10 years and 20 years? I'll finish with just this. You know, as U.S. attorney, I was really lucky. One of the things I got to do was work with the U.S. attorneys around the country and became really good friends with a number of them. Two of my closest friends, one of them was the U.S. Attorney for Detroit and the other the U.S. Attorney for Newark. Cities' fortunes can change very rapidly if we don't continue to innovate and be very smart about how we do growth and how we keep jobs here, but also how we build enough affordable housing. So we got to work together as a region. So I'm hearing clear messages of regionality, working together across the four counties. And I think that, just maybe to close this up, because I think everybody needs to get back to work. Um, we I don't- leave sanctuary? I, I, <laughs> I feel so safe here. I do. I think it's very important that the four counties continue to communicate. Is, am, uh, do, you, do you all agree with that sentiment, that we all keep working together? Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the opportunities that we have in front of us require that regional approach for us to be globally competitive. We have to work together. We have to increase our global brand and, and, and really compete with the rest of the world. And that requires us to, to work as one system. And that one system, we have an opportunity to address these challenges. Housing affordability, homelessness, addiction, we need to improve our infrastructure, and that improving the infrastructure for Everett and Tacoma helps Seattle, right? So anything that we do to support each end of our region supports the entire region. So that approach, I think, is the only way to, to, to help us compete on a global scale. Okay, so time, are we about, okay? Um, Last thoughts, and then we'll skedaddle. Go ahead. I was, I was, I just, I, my last thought will be just the question that you asked. And I think um, being from, you know, one of, one of the cities on the other side of Seattle, and a city that, frankly, um, a lot of people still think we don't want anything to do with Seattle, right? It's like, it's Seattle, not true, though, Seattle, right? No, it's absolutely not true. Seattle's just that big thing. But the reality is, is that we need to wake up and realize, and I know a lot of us in this room have, but there are a lot of people who still haven't. Our competition is not with the three of us. 
We are not competing against one another. Our competition is with other regions um, who were talking about taking jobs out of this area. So I think, you know, for me, our focus, I'm excited to sit down with these other women at, or, and, and gentlemen as well. Um, but, with we'll these other may, but with these other mayors at the table. Women and talk we're, really well together. We okay, really yeah, do. Okay. Um, but, but to recognize that we have to work together because that global competition is not between the three of our cities. We are competing with people across this country and across the world for the jobs um, and opportunities for our communities. So I think it's, it's really important for us to remember that and to continue to break down those barriers. I know for me in Tacoma, anytime somebody says that to me, I'm like, that's not the case. We've got to work together. I would agree that I, I would put a little bit of a different footnote that we haven't talked about is I think we are living in a time that history will write about us as more transformative than the Industrial Revolution because the innovation economy is taking off and the old economy is dropping. We have not get provided enough opportunity to have that uplift for enough of our children and our youth. And if you look at the jobs that are coming to this region in the next 10 years, and even five years, estimated 700,000 plus jobs. Most of them are gonna require some post high school education certificate or degree, mm -hmm. and only 30% of our kids are getting it. We will not be competitive if we don't provide opportunity to all of our kids, regardless of their economic status, their race, or where they are. If we don't create that uplift, then we will have more division in our cities, our societies, our counties. So I think we have to also work on those issues together. We have to make sure that opportunity is shared, that there's affordable housing and opportunity for everyone, that we tackle the issue of homelessness, which is driven by factors that we know what they are. We know what the root causes of homelessness are. And if we don't, those divisions in our cities, our counties, and our state will only get more pronounced and we will not be able to make the progress on the things we care about. So we have to look at systemic racism, we have to look at the differences between opportunity, and we have to make sure that we as a region are preparing our kids for the future. Because if we don't, there is no future. And go ahead. I, I would just add, this is, this is one of the most beautiful places in the world, and the world knows it. We have such unique strengths and assets in, in this region that are very, very unique to this region. And one of the best things about this region is the people and the collaboration across this region. And that is a strength that we really can capitalize on, that our competition across this country and across the world cannot. So I think that is our opportunity that we need to seize to tackle our challenges and to, and to create new opportunities and, and ensure that this is the place to be um, for years and years to come. So. I'm excited to be here. The final thing I'd like to do here real quickly is would all the women elected folks please stand. I see Nancy Bacchus, Mayor Nancy Bacchus. If you're an elected woman, please stand up. Give yourself a round of applause. And, and thank you to the mayors here today. Ladies, it does get easier. It does. <laughs> remember to get some We've sleep. We've got that on tape now. Yes. Remember to get some sleep. It's important. So uh, thank you all very much. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks to everyone out there. Thanks. Great to see you. Well, what uh, four outstanding leaders uh, and our region's in good hands. We have had a request from the floor for all the women elected officials, uh, as soon as we adjourn, to uh, maybe gather in the front uh, for a group picture. And so that was that uh, request was made from somebody there. So um, one last time, thank you so much for being here. As was said by the panel, our future is in our hands. We've got some challenges, but they're best met together and uh, look forward to it. So if, if there's no other business, Seeing none, uh, we are adjourned. <laughs>